If you've ever wondered how much you should be spending on your motherboard and what sort of features you should be looking for, hopefully this video will give you a pretty good understanding of all of those things and a few things to watch out for that are sort of more marketing gimmicks than features. Now I've got a couple of boards surrounding me here, I've got a few prices on a little cheat sheet down here and I've reviewed a whole lot of motherboards so hopefully I'm somewhat qualified to be able to give you at least some sort of understanding of what to look for when buying a motherboard, so let's get into it. Specifically on the point of price, this will very much depend on what type of CPU you want. Now if you want an AMD CPU, the only real class of CPUs that I recommend at the moment are for their FM2 platform. This is Gigabyte's A88X uh, DH, uh, D3HP. It's an FM2 platform motherboard. It uses DDR3 RAM, so that's technically the older standard now. Uh, it does have PCIe for graphics card connectivity though, which is obviously very nice. It has a few other interesting features as well, including a rather nice rear I.O. setup, and there's actually a pretty good value for money. At this point in time in the UK, uh, using my cheat sheet here, it's £56, and I believe it's $69 in America, so definitely a great budget build, especially if you're planning on going for something like that Athlon uh, to X4 860K with you know, something like a GTX 1050 or an RX 460 or 470, this is a very good shout. Now if you want an Intel CPU, there's actually a lot to consider here. First of all, you want to pick what platform you want. If you're looking to do, you know, very heavy uh, video editing, photo editing, um, 3D modeling, all that sort of stuff, then you might want to look at X99. Now, I don't have any boards here that are X99, although I have done a fair few reviews, so I'm going to put some uh, sort of overlays uh, here to show you what some X99 boards look like, but either way, they are relatively expensive. To give you an idea, one of the newer generation ASUS Strix X99 boards costs £285 in the UK and $334 in the US at the time of filming. If you want MSI's X99 carbon board, uh, then that's going to set you back about £300 or about $330. Now again, these are fairly high-end boards and all of the CPUs are somewhere above four to 500 pounds minimum anyway. So these aren't your value for money type of boards, but they do offer obviously the X99 feature set as well as the ability to have those pretty monster CPUs. Not only slightly, and I do mean slightly uh, cheaper end of the spectrum, we do have the uh, Z270 platform. Now that is, as I said, slightly cheaper. It has a maximum of the i7 7700K quad core with hyper-threading CPU. So that is the best platform for me anyway for gaming at this point in time. Of course, Ryzen's coming out fairly shortly, so we'll have to see that one. But uh, at the time being, if you're looking for a high-end motherboard, this MSI M7 is actually a really nice shout. At £260 in the UK or about $240 in the US, which again, US just always better value for money, which is always annoying for me as a Brit. Um, but either way, this is actually a very nice motherboard, even if it is fairly expensive. The Gigabyte Gaming 7 board, which is actually fairly similar to this uh, M7 board from MSI is actually uh, I think £30 cheaper although the same price in the US so it's part your know, generally personal preference for those two boards as they're actually very nice this one has a nicer BIOS but obviously for £30 extra that can get you you know an upgrade on a GPU for example so that might be what you want to go with but either way this is a very nice shout. Something to mention is that the older boards like the Z170X Gaming 7 for Gigabyte they technically do support the 7th generation CPUs. They do require a BIOS update, so you will need to be careful if you've bought a board that was actually manufactured prior to that BIOS update, which means it won't work initially. Uh, so that is just something to be aware of. But either way, technically they still do work, so you can snag a bargain if you pick up one of the older boards that have fairly similar feature sets. I mean, they still feature USB Type-C, NVMe, Thunderbolt 3, and all that sort of stuff. So if you want to see uh, a little bit more money uh, go towards something else then the Z170 boards might be a better option for you. Now I want to talk a little bit about the sort of minimum spend. Now this isn't necessarily, you know, there's no hard and fast rule you must spend more than this on your motherboard. Uh, just the, there's a kind of general rule of just be sensible with it. Obviously if you're buying a relatively low end platform like the FM2 uh, CPUs, you know, the, the Athlon uh, X4 860K then you don't necessarily need to be spending more than 50 60, 70 pounds for a very nice motherboard. Although, of course, if you're buying an X99 motherboard, you're looking at well over 100 to you know 200 pounds for a relatively decent one. Now, if you're buying something from a main brand manufacturer, 
you know, Asus, Gigabyte, MSI, ASRock, uh, those sorts of brands, Biostar as well. You really can't go too wrong in terms of actually, you know, getting something that might potentially damage your uh, components. But at the same time, if you're looking at anything that is what I would call off-brand, then that might be something to consider and you might want to look to spend just a little bit more on something with a name brand from uh, you know, someone a bit more reputable. When it comes to features, there are a few things that you should definitely know about before you, you know, dive in and uh, purchase a board. First thing I wanna mention is actually this heat shield, heat spreader. Uh, it's actually something that's come into contention fairly recently, and it's something that I didn't actually think about, which f now that I'm looking back in hindsight, this is very stupid of me not to think about, but either way, point is, Gamers Nexus did a brilliant test on the actual temperature performance that this heat shield provides. It's now the idea of it is that it's a sort of piece of metal that has a bit of a thermal layer inside a little sort of uh, almost sticky pad that will stick to the SSD and help alleviate heat. Now that's an interesting concept especially considering that a lot of M.2 SSDs have chips on both sides of them now uh, for you know higher data density, higher cooling potential and all that sort of stuff. And the problem with this heat shield is that even though it does you know lower the temperature on the top side, the side that it's connected to by one to two degrees under general use and under sort of heavy stress testing loads, it actually heats up the bottom side by three to four degrees considerably. So that is something to be aware of. Now, actually, I didn't realize this at the time when uh, MSI sent me the press documents, and I do apologize for not noticing this before. This is uh, kind of, uh, it's been annoying me for a little while now that I've known about it, but the point is, MSI's press documents actually showed a Tom's Hardware article talking about uh, another NVMe SSD that only had chips on one side and came with its own heat spreader. So they didn't actually include numbers from their heat spreader, they included numbers from a Plex or NVMe SSD that comes with a heat spreader built onto it. I think that's a little bit dodgy and I'm really not too impressed with that and again it just I'll show you the slide here just so that you can understand how you could mistake this for a normal sensible slide but at the same time I'm really not too impressed with that. There's a few more feature type things I want to talk about especially the ones that I kind of feel a little bit more gimmicky than actual useful so for me stuff like these reinforced RAM slots that are coming on I believe Gigabyte and MSI's i270 motherboards these are something that are more aesthetic than functional I mean you're not going to break a RAM slot unless you're you know just completely stupid and doing it badly so uh, you'll probably break the RAM before you break the slot in that sense um, and the other thing to mention is these uh, reinforced or these armor steel armor um, M.2 slots this is mostly meant to be for uh, ESD protection. I suppose that's okay, but at the same time, I don't really understand how this one little bit that was on plastic, do bear in mind, which is obviously an insulator, um, would be you know necessarily the best place to put ESD shields and stuff. Um, I think personally, again, that's more aesthetic and somewhat on the layer of gimmick rather than uh, you know a very functional, you know, useful addition. So that is just something to be aware of. There are a few uh, things that are coming out that aren't necessarily great features that you uh, you know I wouldn't necessarily put on your list of things that my motherboard must have before I buy it. Now one more thing that I want to sort of myth bust here is that there really isn't a massive performance difference between motherboards at this point. This used to be the case when stuff like the memory controller and Northbridge were all built onto the motherboard and so that an MSI or a Gigabyte board could have fairly different performance numbers but now Intel has moved pretty much everything onto the CPU there really isn't a massive performance difference between between the uh, you know a gigabyte 200 pound motherboard and an MSI 200 pound motherboard and a SUS 200 pound motherboard, there really isn't a, a difference there. There actually isn't much difference between a 100 pound MSI motherboard and a you know 300 pound MSI motherboard if, as long as you're comparing on the same you know Z270 platform. Now one thing to mention is that there is actually different chipsets, especially uh, B250 and H210, I think it is, uh, that don't allow overclocking. So that is something to be aware of. But also another thing to point out is that some of the lower end Z270 boards are all still capable of overclocking. And while they do have different power phase designs, which means uh, the VRMs or voltage regulator modules, uh, which turn the voltage down from 12 and five volts to usable CPU voltage at the point at this point in time, I think it's 1.35 volts for a stock 7700K. Uh, so you know, the more power phases in theory you have, the cleaner the power is in theory. Um, but that will obviously depend on 
a lot of other factors that we can go into in a separate video but uh, either way you will still be able to overclock on lower end Z270 motherboards and especially if you're just sort of you know overclocking for the sake of overclocking because you, because you bought a k skew CPU and you're not really very much pushing it there really isn't a massive difference for you. So that answered the question in the title of how much you should spend on your motherboard and also gave you an idea of what features you should be looking for and avoiding and all that sort of stuff. If it was useful for you and enjoyable to watch then please do let me know in the comments down below and of course if I got anything wrong where this is just common sense to you then let me know in the comments down below too. Otherwise, if you want to help me out, the two best things that you can do is subscribe and share the video. They're completely free things to do, obviously, it means that you get more access to these sorts of videos and it helps me out massively. And of course, if you're already buying stuff on Overclockers UK or Amazon Affiliate at Amazon, then please do use the affiliate links in the description down below. It does genuinely help me out. It genuinely keeps all these videos going. It helps me buy the lights that now light this and uh, all that sort of stuff. So please do use those when you can and otherwise, uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of that really. Feel free to check out some of the other videos. I'll leave some videos over here for you to check out. Of course, there's subscribe annotation over here. And otherwise, uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of that. So thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you all in the next video.